Well, we went on holidays recently and I got a reminder of how much cars have changed in my lifetime. I, almost everything seems to have changed in my lifetime. I don't know about yours. It doesn't matter how old you are. Everything's changed in your lifetime. And anyway, when we got to the rental car counter in Sydney, they said, oh, we can offer you a range of cars today. We can, we can give you an upgrade. Oh, that's all right. And so instead of getting my little economy car to rent for a week, I got a brand new, fully souped up BMW M Series <laughs> for a week. With all the bells and whistles, it took me about five days to work out <laughs> how to use enough of it to be able to drive the thing. Anyway, that made me reflect back to when I was young. And my dad had a 1950s Holden, and there might be a few here old enough to remember 1950s Holden. And back in those days, the young people wouldn't be able to believe this, but just getting the car started in the morning was an important part of what you had to do, especially during winter. So when that happened that the car wouldn't start, what we would do is several of us kids, I came from a big family, and several of us kids would push the car down the street and then when we got up to enough speed, one of us, who was old enough, although not old enough to have a licence, sorry, ex-policeman in the room, but, you know, one of us would get into the car, put in second gear, you know, let the clutch off, and, <coughs> and if it got going, we had a car for the day. If it didn't, we had, a, in our long street, we had about three goes of that, and if it didn't work by the end of the street, what we had was about uh, a tonne or so of metal at the bottom of the street that we had to then try and push back up the hill. <laughs> because you see, there's one thing about cars that hasn't changed over all these years, whether it's petrol, petrol or electric or hydrogen or diesel, it's made to function not on us pushing it forward, but on us relying on its, its power to propel us. It's the same in the Christian life. And in the Christian church, it's very hard, very hard, trying to live the Christian life, trying to see good things happen in the Christian church unless we're relying on the source of spiritual power for life that God intends for us to have individually and together. Certainly, you know, there's so much in life that can seem like we're just having to push through life, isn't there? But we want to just pause this morning to rewind as we've got on the screen and to remember and to celebrate and to be encouraged to appropriate afresh God's amazing gift of his power for our lives. You see, it was Jesus who said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the gift of God himself within us. Now that won't mean there won't be any hills or any more difficulties in life, but it will mean there will be a sense that there is a power that's enabling us. There's something given to us that helps us. There's a presence that's guiding us. There's a father who's close and is blessing us. There's a voice of a friend that's encouraging us all along the way. What a gift, the Holy Spirit. Just as Paul was keen to remind his readers to go on being filled with the Spirit, it's a very good thing that Pastor Dan wants us to do today to rewind quite often to the point where we remember and rejoice in and are refreshed again in the Holy Spirit. To be reminded that to come into an experience with Jesus Christ is not just an understanding in our head, is it? or an acceptance of certain beliefs, or a belonging to a certain community of people. No, through what Jesus himself called the gift of the Father, each and every one of us is now to experience the spiritual presence and power of God in our inner daily lives in a way that will be the same for us all because there's one spirit and yet it'll be unique for every single one of us because God's made us all to be unique. To be reminded that to personally experience God's Holy Spirit, that's the normal Christian life. That's what we want to do this morning, to be reminded about that. So that we can live lives marked with the life he brings and is bringing into us. You know, he brings his love into our hearts. Romans 5 tells us God pours his very love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So as we are refreshed in the Holy Spirit, the love of God's flowing in his community. 
He brings his joy, his patience, his kindness, the courage, the visions and the dreams that come to us from God by his spirit to live and to reveal to others what it means when Jesus said that we're going to live life to the full. You know, we can manage without so much. We could even manage this morning without a preacher. You know that? We could, couldn't we? But we can't be the church of Jesus Christ without the Holy Spirit, amen? Amen. And because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing else with the potential of Jesus anywhere in all creation, amen? I just want to talk a little about the Holy Spirit for those who might not have heard all of this before. The Bible introduces us to the Holy Spirit in its first verses where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Here we see the creative spirit presence of God was there to bring good and excellent things out of chaos and darkness in the very big picture of the world. The Spirit of God's purpose to bring good and excellent things out of chaos. And the Spirit of God was active during all the time of the Old Testament. We see as we look through the history of God's people that the Holy Spirit came close to humanity as he touched God's people by coming upon particular people at particular times for particular reasons through all of Israel's history to bless them and to guide them and to empower them, to lead them. How good is that? But what we want to remember today is what God had been waiting to reveal as his gift to the new creation he was going to commence through Jesus. And this, that gift is this, the unlimited gracious outpouring of his spirit into the lives of ordinary people not special people to do some tiny special task in the history of the world, ordinary people for all of our lives, into the lives of ordinary people, of all those who will ask. Hints of this gift were given uh, long ago through Ezekiel in chapter 36, where he said, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And in Joel 2, that we know is quoted in Acts by Peter, where he says, and we know many of us know this so well, and afterwards I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, regardless of age, regardless of gender, Regardless of ethnic or language or cultural group, it's for you and me. The promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit is for all. And then, from a moment in history that God had set, from the time when the moment of Jesus' birth was approaching, something changed in the spiritual realm. Suddenly the Holy Spirit, the great Spirit who brooded over the the, uh, creation, the Holy Spirit whose touch on humans had seemed to be only on the special chosen few. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit was touching everyone surrounding the birth of Jesus. Something new and world-changing was happening. It began with John the Baptist, Luke 2.15. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. With Mary, because the very conception of Jesus was a miracle of the Holy Spirit bringing the refreshing life of God into humanity with Elizabeth, the moment she came near to Jesus in the womb of Mary, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Zechariah, when John the Baptist was born, he was filled with the Spirit and prophesied. Then Jesus himself, born by the Spirit, was joined by the Spirit at his baptism. The scripture tells in Luke 3, as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And then it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit, Luke 4, 1, into the wilderness, led by the Spirit into the wilderness of testing. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus resisted totally the evil powers of this world. Aren't you glad he did that? It's been done. The evil powers of this world have been defeated. And then it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Luke 4, 14, for spirit-empowered life and ministry. 
And John the Baptist confirmed that Jesus' intention and mission was to equip all of his people with the difference that comes only from a personal and inner encounter with the Holy Spirit of God. Luke 3, 16, John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one who's more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie, he will baptise you with Holy Spirit and fire. This gift, this presence, this spirit that defined Jesus' life and ministry is to be for all whom he calls his own. And Jesus testified about the coming of the gift of the Spirit for all in John 7 where he said, where it said, on the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who's thirsty come to me, Jesus said, and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And we're told uh, by John, he says, by this Jesus meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And when Jesus' death was imminent, what did he focus on in that last time of intimate teaching with his close followers? If you look in John 14 to 16, he focuses on his care for them, but it's totally interwoven with the promise of the Holy Spirit, the comfort and presence of the Holy Spirit. So many verses like John 14, 26, where it says, but the help of the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. And even to the point of Jesus saying this in John 16, 7, but I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, that's the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus was saying, we are better off now having the Holy Spirit to live within us than if Jesus was standing here in the front of this group of people. And then when the resurrected Jesus met with his disciples for the first time, what did he do? John 20, 22, in a really unusual voice, verse, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the holy breath of God into yourself. This infilling of the breath of God, the life of his spirit is what Jesus desired and what he desires still for his loved ones. And so in his final instructions to his gathered disciples before his ascension, he instructs them, don't do anything. Don't go anywhere until you've received this gift that my father has promised. Do, Acts 1.4, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you heard me speak about. For John baptised in water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Do you know, in a very real way, all that Jesus did, even on the cross, was so that we, his people on this planet, could be filled with the Holy Spirit. You can read in detail in Acts 2 exactly what happened on that first Pentecost Sunday as a gathered praying disciples receive for the first time the infilling presence of the Holy Spirit. And a small and timid group of people began to shout the word of God in the languages of all nations with such joy and overflowing praise that some people even thought they were drunk. It was some day, the day the church was born. Peter said to the crowds who gathered to see what was going on, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And 3,000 people came to faith in one day. You know, that never would have happened without the Holy Spirit. That never would have happened without the Holy Spirit. A church began that day who were outward looking and who prayed and worshipped and cared for one another and shared with one another and that never would have happened unless the Holy Spirit was given. That never would have happened without the Holy Spirit. A church that could withstand persecution, that could not have happened without the Holy Spirit. A church that began to change the world, that can never happen without the Holy Spirit and it still can't happen today without the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there on that day? Anyone else like me, you'd love to have been in that room with 120? Wow, that would have been awesome. And you might think, oh, well, my life would be different if I was there on that Pentecost 
Sunday. Of course, it would be different because you would have gone to glory 2,000 years ago. But, you know, that's one of the small differences. But, you know, but you might think, oh, be, if we were there, if we were there, if we saw the tongues of fire and the mighty wind, we'd be changed. But do you know what? Paul the Apostle wasn't there either. And he experienced the fullness of the Spirit. And he wrote Ephesians and more of the New Testament than anyone else. In Ephesians, he encouraged the church to go on being filled with the Spirit. Paul wasn't there that day, certainly not as a believer. That first Pentecost day was a one-off, but what God started that day, it's never stopped for followers of Jesus. None of us can be at that Pentecost, but every one of us who believed is promised the gift of our own personal and ongoing experience of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. You see, Jesus' people are Holy Spirit people. I grew up in a church that was a Baptist church that didn't really talk about the Holy Spirit. And I'm glad that we now live in, in, a, we're in a church and we're in a situation where we know that Jesus wants us to be full of the Holy Spirit. I want you to be full of the Holy Spirit for what that's worth. This church wants you to be full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus' people are Holy Spirit people. When Paul encountered a group of believers in Ephesians who seemed a little bit different from what he expected, he asked them just one question, Acts 19. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we haven't heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So he laid hands on them and prayed for them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit just like at the beginning. So can I ask you a personal question? Have you received the personal gift from the Father of the presence of his Holy Spirit in your life. You might ask today, well, how can I know? Well, I can tell you that there'll be evidences of, of his Spirit in your life. Firstly, in your personal, honest confession of Jesus as Lord. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, obviously, anyone can say the three words, Jesus is Lord. What's meant here is, no one can say Jesus is my Lord from your heart without the Holy Spirit being in your life. So if you can say in truth that Jesus is your Lord, then praise God, you're a Holy Spirit person. And neither can this next miracle happen except by the Spirit of God, Romans 8.15. And by the Holy Spirit we cry, Abba, Father. To be able to relate to God as his child through Christ, to be able to call God, Daddy, Father. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. If you're not able to call, talk to God in that way, if God to you is just God, he's not Father, he's not Daddy, then I encourage you to ask for the Holy Spirit to enable you to, be able to relate to God in that way. That's where the power comes from. But there are so many other wonderful evidence of the Spirit that we can expect and will experience as his people. It might be an incredible and new joy that you experience in worship. You might have been coming here for years, thought it was a bit boring. You receive the Holy Spirit, you'll be filled with joy. There's a story of a lady who came into this experience of the Spirit when she came to faith in Jesus and she felt such joy that she couldn't explain it or contain it. She decided to go to church and she was so filled with joy that in the middle of the worship she called out, Hallelujah! And one of the deacons of the church went over to her and asked her to be quiet. We don't do that sort of thing here, he said. She said, not knowing how better to explain what had happened to her, but I'm excited, I've got religion. And he looked back at her and he said, well, you didn't get it here. <laughs> you see, the Spirit brings joy. Just as he did on that first Pentecost, so much joy that people thought they were drunk. And yet they would have passed any breathalyzer. You can still, you can be filled with the, with the Spirit of God and filled with his joy and you don't have to worry about the breathalyzer. Isn't that fantastic? And the Spirit brings the warmth, warmth of God's love. Many people testify that's what they sense most when they're filled with the Spirit. The sense of being incredibly loved by God. You know, we all live different lives. Some of us have huge families. Some of us have not many people or feel like they've got no one around them. No one needs to be alone. No one needs to be fully alone because you can know the love of your Father God in your heart through the Holy Spirit and to be welcomed into a family of people where you are family. 
of Holy Spirit people. And the Spirit brings his boldness and his equipping for life and ministry, a feeling of coming home. And many gifts, the speaking in tongues, gifts of knowledge, gifts of prophecy, to speak God's word in power, gifts to be used by God in healing and to pray for others, gifts to encourage one another and so much more. I don't think there's any limit to what the Spirit can do in our lives and I think that's why when you look in Scripture there are different lists of the gifts and that's there to tell us no one can write a definitive list. Right? There's more gifts of the Spirit than can be written down. And we'll experience the fruit of the Spirit in, in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faith control and faithfulness and self-control for we are a people in whom God dwells by his spirit. You see, when you receive the spirit, you'll know because there'll be the fruit of his, parent, of his presence in your life. So the key message about the Holy Spirit is this, as we rewind to the Holy Spirit today, if you've not received him, receive the precious gift of God to you. As Peter said that first Pentecost Sunday, repent, turn to Jesus, and you will receive. For those of us who, who know we have received the gift of the Spirit, do we need a refilling? Do you need a refilling to ensure you have the power we need for life? All of us need refilling. Even pastors need refilling, don't they? Pastor's wife. Not just to trudge through life like trying to push an old car uphill, but to know we have the power for all that life might head our way, to live in his power. Jesus is the spirit baptiser. He desires to overwhelm us, to drench us, to fill us with his spirit. I wonder if you've ever seen one of those old uh, real sea sponges, you know, that they have in flash bathrooms. If it's left out of the water for too long, it just becomes hard and brittle. Sometimes we can become like that dry sponge, even if we've been sitting here a long time. But if you place that sponge right back into the water, it becomes soft and it fills with water and when you lift it out, the water pours out. That's how God wants us to be, filled to overflowing with his Holy Spirit. So you might ask me this morning, how can I be filled with the Spirit? I just want to share five quick points. Firstly, to let you know I can't do it. I can't fill you with the Spirit. None of us can control the Spirit of God. We need to be in awe of him. Jesus said in John 3, the wind blows wherever it, wherever it likes. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it's going, where it's coming from. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. This is a work of God. This is not something I can control from the pulpit. I can't fill you with the Spirit. You can't fill me. But God is wanting and willing to bring the refreshing breeze of his Spirit into any waiting heart. The second one is the Spirit is not a one-off gift. The scripture is very clear that we're to go on receiving and being filled is a gift to receive and a gift that many of us have received. But it's not good to say, I received the Holy Spirit 10 or 50 years ago and that was enough. That might be the case, but if it is, it's extraordinarily sad. That's not the Christian, the normal Christian life. No, what we should be expecting, nor what we should be expecting or satisfied with. He's the best gift we can ever receive because he's the gift promised by the Father with whom we go on being filled to be able to live life to the full through Jesus Christ. Thirdly, the Spirit of God is for you. Some people think the Spirit, Holy Spirit is not for them. They don't maybe like the idea of losing control to something spiritual and so they resist surrendering to the Spirit. But Christians are called to surrender to the Spirit. When you call Jesus Lord, think about it, when you call Jesus Lord, that means you're under his Lordship and the Holy Spirit is his Spirit. We are called to surrender to him. You can trust his Spirit whose only desire is to fill you with his life. For others, they think the Spirit is only for special people, for pastors or for good people or for the small group of pastors who are good people or for clever people, or for attractive people, for younger people than them, or for older people than them, or for leaders doing important work. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's Old Testament thinking. The Holy Spirit is here now for you as much as for anyone else. 
Fourthly, the gift of the Spirit in you is for all of us. To, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. According to the Bible, it is as each of us is filled in the creative ways of God that the church is equipped to be the church of Jesus in the world. According to the Bible, it is, it is as each of us is filled with the Holy Spirit that we're able to be the church of Jesus Christ for this world. And fifthly, there's more. We have to be filled again. There's more. I'm um, getting into middle age and it's easy to think, well, maybe at this stage you just slow down. But you know what the risk is? If you just slow down and you just become ordinary, you know what happens? It starts to happen that God is not the main love of your life. We can't just become ordinary. We have to continue to be those who say, my first goal in life is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength and to love my neighbour as I love my, myself and to love my wife as Christ loved the church and laid himself down for her. And we can't do that unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so if we think, oh, I'm, I'm just getting a bit older, you know, I'll just you know, put down the tools and, and let other people do it, you're going to drift. And that doesn't apply only if you're older. We need to go on being filled with the Spirit to be his people and we need it for all of our lives. So this morning, Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, every human heart is a spiritual thirst. Jesus says, come to me and drink streams of living water, the comforting, strengthening, life-giving presence of the Holy Spirit who will flow from within us. In a minute we're going to join again in singing one last worship song and I invite the band to come out just to be with us on the stage. But if they're around, they might have gone home. <laughs> and uh, if they don't, we'll go on without them. No, here they come. But we're not going to have any music just for a minute uh, because I want the band to join in with this. We're just going to invite everyone to stand. And I just want to give us all an opportunity together. You know what matters most to God? Is, is he would love to hear, I believe, for every single one of us in our heart. You can pray out loud if you like or in your heart. Just for each of us individually to say something like this. Father, I want to be filled again with your Holy Spirit. The band to say it, to pray it. For us all just to pray that. So I'm just going to allow... You know, 30 seconds. Let's all pray, asking to be filled with the Spirit. What a holy moment, Father, when we stand together before the one who sees every heart. Jesus was the one who said, others look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And I know with confidence that many, many hearts here today have asked to be filled again with your spirit, just as I have asked, Father. We come in Jesus' name. We ask that you would fill the community of your people today, again with your spirit, Lord. And not only uh, this once and then another time when we might preach on it, but go on filling us, we pray. Fill new generations with your spirit. Let them not be bounded by what we've seen in the past. Let them only be bounded, Lord, by what your spirit calls the church to be. Let those of us who are older, Lord, not drift into old age, but draw nearer to you. Let us be the old men and the old women who dream dreams. 
Thank you that your Holy Spirit is here. Thank you that he sustains us. Thank you that right now you're filling us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.